Welcome. You're listening to Entanglement Radio on the Conversations from the Brink Network. I am your host, Angela Levesque, and this show is all about the potential and possibilities of what it means to be human. Um, if you have never been uh, to Conversations from the Brink, you can go to conversationsfromthebrink.com, and it is really a multimedia hub um, that is all about insight and inspiration for humanity's next step. And it is very multimedia. You can find videos, podcasts, um, op-ed pieces, blog posts, articles, all sorts of things that are really here to um, engage and, and I think uh, increase or heighten the conversations that we are having now about where we want to go um, economically, socially, culturally, um, in many different ways. So if you haven't checked it out, you can go to conversationsfromthebrink.com. You can find more about Entanglement Radio there. And if you'd like to know a little bit more about myself, Angela Levesque, you can go to hestiahealth.com. And of course, uh, we love social media. Uh, We post things that uh, are featured on our website as well as things that we just think, um, like I said, enhance the conversations that we need to be having. So uh, you can find us on Facebook and on Twitter. Um, And one thing I do want to mention as well, one of um, the things that we're going to be implementing on Conversations from the Brink is really facilitating um, conversations on and offline. And we're going to do that through a variety of groups. And we actually started our first kind of pilot group um, call, doing a monthly healing circle. So if you want to check that out, it is also up on the website um, under groups. And we hope to facilitate groups in the future in the slow food movement, in um, just sustainability, in technology, in you know clean energy, all sorts of things. So uh, keep your eyes open for that as those unfold in the next few months. Um, this week, we have a beautiful, beautiful um, lady on talking about uh, innovation within the Latino community, and that is Grace, Graciela Tescarnoto Soto. Oh, I totally butchered that, but I'm going to let her <laughs> introduce herself in just a minute. Coming up next week, we have Mark Harth- Hawthorne on, and he's going to be talking about his book, A Vegan Ethic. And we're really going to be diving in, obviously, the ethics of veganism, but also just how, um, if we bring more compassion into our food system, how we bring compassion to the rest of the world. And I really do think that as, um, as we move forward, and think about our new economy, and we think about how we're going to be using our arable land, that we do need to uh, move towards a more plant-based diet. So we're going to talk about that, um, even if you're not ready to jump into veganism, but um, is it possible to just include uh, more vegetarian meals in our in our lives just on a weekly basis? So we'll be talking about that. But As I mentioned today, um, we are talking about innovation in the green movement, especially within the Latino community. And so let me introduce my guest, Graciela. I'm going to let her say that. Is a bilingual sought-after speaker and president of Gracefully Global Group, the premier award-winning publishing and marketing firm for Latino innovation, entrepreneurship, and leadership stories. She's the best-selling author of the five-time award-winning book, Latinovating Green American Green American Jobs and the Latinos Creating Them. She is a graduate of the School of Environmental Design at UC Berkeley, a former military officer, an aviator, and an active mentor to Latino youth. She earned her graduate degree in international management and marketing while flying on U.S. Air Force KC-135 refueling jets. Um, Her first children's picture book, uh, Goodnight Captain Mama, is the first bilingual book teaching young children why mummies wear military uniforms. It was honored as Best Educational Children's Book in the Bilingual Category in the 2014 International Latino Book Awards. So with that, I feel very honored and blessed. Welcome, Graciela, to the program. All right. Okay. Thank thank you, Angela. (laughs) I apologize. I'm going to need for you to say your name uh, because it is um, it is beyond my my tongue today. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I appreciate all the effort. Really, it's uh, it's a little bit different, but it's very multicultural, very California. It is Graciela Tiscareño Sato, hyphenated, and it's Spanish maiden name. And my husband is Japanese Sato, so Tiscareño Sato. A little bit unusual. <laughs> uh, it's beautiful. Well, you know, we all. Uh, have our own background and upbringings, and I, I just, I just enjoy listening to you say it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, let's start. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are talking about innovation, especially in the green movement within the Latino community. And I got to say, as I'm reading your book, I was very inspired. I just, not only was I inspired um, um, because, you know, you're focusing on the Latino community, but just I was inspired because I just see that people um, are just coming up with different ways of doing things. And that's, I think, really what we need to happen. So let's start um, kind of uh, at the beginning. At what inspired you to write this book? Yes, that is the, the important question. It, it is such an unusual collection, isn't it? Yes. So, so I was working in a corporate sustainability role at uh, the German conglomerate de Siemens, and I was working in the communications enterprise networks uh, business uh, after leaving the military. So about, I'd say about eight years into it, um, that's when I was in that particular corporate sustainability role. And our technology was really about reducing carbon footprints of large companies, reducing energy consumption, reducing space used, really just having a smaller uh, footprint by using more intelligent technology. So in that role, I remember thinking, this just speaks to me in terms of efficiency, uh, you know, making decisions as if the planet matters. Because culturally, as a daughter of Mexican immigrants, I was always taught to be smart with resources and what we had in the home and reuse everything and think before you throw it away. What could you do with it? So those little lessons of growing up just with that mindset, I was thinking this just makes sense to me that we, you know, we apply the, this thinking at a, at a bigger level. And so I started thinking, but wait a minute, are we in the Latino community, are we participating in some way in all this innovation? Are we creating stuff? You know, I'm in my little, you know, silo in a corporate role, but I started having this question come up over and over in my head. Are we participating in the green economy? And so curiosity, just a question floating around in my head. And I had started meeting people that were doing interesting things and creating, you know, software and, and different things like that. So when I got a call from... Uh, an editor, he asked me, would you do the feature article for Hispanic MBA this year for our conference issue? Do you have a topic? I just kind of threw it out there. I said, I would like to do an article called The Green Economy, His, The Greening of America, Hispanic Environmental Advocates Lead the Way. And I said, I have a feeling that we are innovating. I have a feeling that we are participating. I'm meeting a few people. I'm going to explore that because I think it's a story that needs to be told about our contributions, Right. So it was a curiosity, a call from an editor, and then I published this article uh, for the conference in Minneapolis in the fall of 2009. And it was really, Angela, an article about, I think it was 15 different Latinos working in different industries who had all invented something, started a business, or had worked in a corporate role like I was doing, and then started the business to do it better because they saw the way their company was doing it was really not green. It was greenwashing. So then I got inspired by, well, who are these courageous people that leave their corporate jobs to start companies? Who are they? So, so this is really a lot of where it came from. And then, of course, after the article was published and I went to the conference, people wanted to know more about the person. Who are the people that actually create those businesses? Who are the people that actually invent? Who are the people that actually think about a better way to do it? And so... When I got that feedback, I knew I had to go back to the people I interviewed. I knew, I knew I needed to trim it down. I did 10 case studies for the book. And then I knew I needed to dig deeper and go back to childhood, go back to cultural lessons, go back to familial lessons, and go back to understand what is the foundation in childhood, what is the educational pathway that ultimately leads to innovation. And that is where this all came from. It was really my corporate role a call from an editor, a chance to publish an article, and then understanding that there was a whole lot more that we needed to know about entrepreneurship, about innovation. Mm -hmm. And um, very importantly, um, I, you know, yes, it is about people innovating who are Latinos, but certainly what they are creating benefits everybody. And I actually say it in the tagline, you know, the innovators are Latinos, the benefits are for everyone, because these are business stories their environmental stories, their social entrepreneurship stories, and yes, leadership stories. So one thing that I um, 
I think is very interesting is that you did decide to tell these stories as case studies. And like you said, you, you dug deeper, you went into their childhood, and then you talked about their path to education and then, you know, the, some of the values in, that they were instilled with growing up. Why do you think that it's so important to dive into those stories versus it just being, you know, I talked to several people and, and this is some of the trends and the things that I saw versus, you no, know, meet this person and what they have done. Why do you think that's a, a more powerful way to pre- present that? Well, the article initially was all about the innovation. It was very much, you know, the magazine was Hispanic MBA, so it was, you know, professional people wanting to know about, you know, professional themes. So the first article was really about, here's this person working here who invented that. It was really, really focused. To answer your question, it is the questions that followed when we got that first peek into something awesome created by, let's say, Luis Rojas, is people wanted to know, but who is he? And what happened in his life that led him to be the person who would make those decisions, who would have those values? We want to know who he is. And the reason it's important is because so many of us, Latino or not, and this is very important, Latino or not, were raised with these values of conservation, of preservation, of reuse. You know, I've heard stories from uh, kids in the Midwest adults in the Midwest whose grandparents lived through the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl and how their parents were raised and therefore they were raised really the same way that I was raised of. Okay, so, you know, some socks don't have the other pair. Well, what could you do with those socks? Or, you know, these pants have holes in the knees. Well, you can repair them or you can turn them into shorts or you can maybe turn them into a shawl (laughs) or whatever. But I've heard these stories. And so I think it's really important to stop and recognize that we all share, so many of us, not all, but a lot of us share these basic beliefs that we shouldn't throw things away. We don't have the throwaway consumer mentality. We really have a different value system. And I wanted to tell a story of how those values in childhood communicated from your family, your parents, your grandparents. They are the all-important foundation plus education that leads you to be able to be the person that can innovate and who will innovate. Because a lot of people have ideas, just, you know, like a fleeting idea might happen in the shower or whatever, but it is the people that are grounded in these deep belief systems that the environment matters, that resources matter, that there is a better way and I'm going to find it. And I've watched my parents and grandparents create and recreate and reuse. When that's really built into your mindset, you will be the person who actually becomes the innovator. You will be the person who actually leads an industry in a different direction. And that is why it's important because we need to recognize that so many people have that potential, but I think it's imperative to show how actual people alive today take that and then what do they study? What do they do after they graduate from university? Where do they work? What path professionally culturally and personally did they take to lead them to where they are? Because maybe I can do the same thing. It's all about amplifying the, the, the success stories in the green economy so that more people will think this way, more people will choose to innovate. That's why I did it that way, Angela. It's the whole continuum of childhood through higher education, through professional experience, and ultimately entrepreneurship and innovation. I just think we need more of it. And I think the way we get there is show people who are doing it because I really believe we have to inspire and motivate through real examples. And honestly, that's a big driver of why I'm writing these books. Well, I want to say something about growing up culturally. My, my grandmother, she, was, um, she immigrated from Italy and, and had nine children. And they grew up, they had a big farm, and um, they were quite poor. And my grandma, she was one of the green movement ambassadors and she didn't even know it. She would re it wasn't even just, you know, if something came in a plastic tray that she would recycle it. It was like, no, we've got to save this. How can we use this? Exactly the same story as so as I was reading the book, I was like, yes, I feel connected to that too. And even though my grandma wasn't up on a soapbox talking about, you know, the green movement or environmentalism, that was just the way that she lived. And it was Exactly. And it wasn't just because she was poor. It was also like you said, there was um 
values within that about not being wasteful, about realizing, uh, you know, she made bread from scratch. I remember her showing me, she would show me how to make bread, and she'd be like, this is how the pioneers do it. She knew how things came to be because she sewed and she made things, you know, she made bread and pasta from scratch. But, you know, so it wasn't just about not having enough money. It was also just about understanding um, how things are made and where they come from and having that deep connection to the, the earth and the resources. And so I really connected with that, um, that aspect of your book. You know, it's an amazing example you just, you just gave there because what you just talked about was, first of all, you know, let, let's be real, right? It's, a lot of it is if you don't have the financial resources to keep buying over and over again, you are forced to be creative, right? So there's, there's a confluence in, in your story with the Latino Vaders. Now, again, not all of them come from poverty, so I have to add that footnote because there's several stories of um, you know, families from Latin America, six generations back of university graduates who uh, are not like my family who were the Mexican immigrants, and so we started there, right, like your grandmother, but it's the confluence of, you know, in most cases of uh, lack of economic resources plus a value system that teaches you all those lessons and respecting and, and being a steward, really respecting the earth, respecting resources, being a steward. Plus, your grandmother was a maker. She made bread. She made pasta. She sewed, right? My mom sewed. She made cakes. She made so many things. My father was a tailor. So, and the Latino Vaders... Their parents, we have painters, we have sculptors, we have... So it is, it is that creativity. It is, it is children of immigrants growing up, observing innovation, creativity every day. It just is. So when you see that, that, that's exactly what I mean by you take that foundation and then you layer on higher education in whatever you decide to study, that is the positioning that is needed for leadership and innovation. And those are the stories that are in the book. And, and I just think that confluence you just described with your grandmother is exactly it. It's like all three things. I remember a, a presentation I did in Palo Alto, uh, where Stanford University is, and it was a community college about two miles away from Stanford. The editor of the student paper was this uh, young Caucasian guy. He's about 21 years old. He came up to me afterwards and he says, you know what? I think I really missed something growing up. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I'm thinking about the stories that you showed us today of how the Latino Vaders grew up, and I'm thinking of how I grew up. When my Levi's got a hole in them, my mom would throw them away, and we'd drive down to the Stanford Shopping Center and get a new pair. And so, therefore, I think I missed something really important in my childhood. And I said, well, you did. And it was so cool that he recognized that. That when you have that, well, just start away, go get a new one mentality, you're completely missing out on the ability to think, create, reuse, reinvent, and ultimately to be the innovators and the Latino innovators. And I just thought that was an amazing insight that this young man shared with me after the presentation. And, you know, as you're saying that, really having to, you talk about um, creative uh, reuse. And I was thinking, yes, I mean, that, that asks you to think outside of the box. And when you, take, when you take that skill and you realize that that being able to problem solve, to use things creatively, that, like you said, that's so connected to innovation, to coming up with new ways of using things. And so I really, um, I understood that when I read the book, but just listening to you speak that, uh, speak on that right now, I'm really connecting with how that skill then becomes applicable to so many other areas of our lives. And that right. being able to, to see things and see that there are way, there are many different uses for this other than the ones, you know, that, that it's marketed for, for example. Right. And then that extends into when you take the next step and you start a business, when you start a company, those values then become the organizational culture. And those values tell you that you can't throw away your people. Those values help you make decisions like Carmen in the first chapter, who in 20 years of being in business has never laid off a single person. Even though her industry started out as printing and then everybody outsourced to China and she didn't, she took a different direction. She pivoted to you know, new products or biodegradable large format printing. She laid off nobody she retrained her people. So it matters who starts the company. It matters the value system. And I, I think this is why these stories are such 
important examples of sustainability, of, of creating a company with those values from day one versus what you hear a lot about now is, you know, giant company number 17 is starting a sustainability initiative and they want to become more sustainable because, you know, what that means is they haven't been, right? And, and there is no closed loop with manufacturing and they haven't thought about what happens to our products when people are done using them. But when you start the company with those value systems that we're talking about, it's an entirely different organization. It's an entirely different place to work. It's an entirely different mission, and that's why it's social entrepreneurship. Yes, it's entrepreneurship. Yes, you are creating a business. Yes, there's revenue that you're achieving, thank goodness. But you're doing it in a socially beneficial way. And I think that is so important. We just need more of that going forward. And the way we will get more of our students and kids to grow up, knowing that that's what's needed, is to show them how so much is missing in the how. And so these are the how stories. How how he started a solar development company that puts schools on renewable energy. You know, how he invented an energy storage system based on the melting of ice. All of those stories, um, the, the how is imperative. And then, of course, in each chapter, I put resources so that it's not just, you know, okay, we're done with that chapter, go on. It's like, okay, I'm really, really jazzed now about the sustainable packaging movement and Dennis Salazar's part in it. And so here's a bunch of resources that he provided and I'm including from my research when I interviewed him. And now you can actually go dig deeper and maybe take a class, maybe enroll in a program. So I really want, and I, I describe these, Angela, as actionable inspiration, these stories. They're inspiring, yes, because they're real. But there's action that you can take when you're done and when you're excited about what you just learned. Hmm. You know, you're kind of blowing my mind a little bit here because as I'm listening to you, especially talk about the values and having those values as part of the, the business at the beginning. And I'm looking, like you said, companies who are now just trying to maybe, maybe they're making real sincere efforts or sometimes maybe they're just greenwashing, trying to make it look on the outset. But I think that that has, you know, a lot of people have issue when they think about these big corporations because they don't have, um, a sense of morality or a sense of social responsibility. And so having that and teaching this message to our kids and saying, no, that this this social responsibility, these values, whatever they are for you, they have to be built in. They have to be part of the foundational aspects. And I think that that will go um, a long way in helping other people um, begin to trust uh companies again, because I think that there's a lot of distrust of business because we think, you know, business equals, um, you know, exploitation of resources and, and manpower and all of that. And so I just really, there's such a deeper message and I think a larger um, outcome out of having these conversations. So yeah, you're just kind of, all these little aha moments are going off in my brain right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good because, you know, there, there is a lot to each story. They're, they're human, human interest stories. They're stories of creativity, deep, deep stories of creativity. They're stories of overcoming adversity. They're, these are all stories of mentoring. I don't know if you saw that in there, but in, there's a theme in a lot of these stories of somebody who stepped in to mentor a kid like me whose parents came from somewhere else and had no college education, but a mentor stepped into our lives when we were in, in high school and showed us the way to university where we could be exposed to all these other ideas and all these other ways to do things. And that is fundamental because the, the, the foundation is already there. But it is that aspect of exposure to different people, different thoughts, different ways so that you can say, oh, I like this. I love the way they did that company and they started that. I love the way they operate. And like, oh my God, I'm so offended by the way they do that. It is that exposure that you get in the world through education and, and through professional work that then led each of these Latino innovators to have their aha moment. And when I speak at universities or when I speak at conferences, I actually... You know, I usually do like three or four stories depending on the time, but I always have a slide with a spark. And I talk about the, the idea spark. You know, when Sandra Artalejo had that idea that she had to start her own fashion design company, you know, doing it in a not wasteful way, what was the moment when she said, I have to do this? Same with each of the people. There's, there comes a moment where something happens. You see an evil in your company. You see, you walk out of the studio in New York and you see all these bins just full of brand new fabric rolls that are just thrown in the trash bin. She tells me this story. And 
she's looking at all these brand new rolls of brand new fabric that the designers that bought the roll, did a sample, and threw out the rest because they don't want to store it. And she's looking at this going, oh, my God, my grandmother would be horrified. My grandmother who made, you know, dresses out of curtains and everything. So, you know, there there is that evil in companies that just don't care and, you know, they're whatever. And so that's out there. But it's when you see it and when you, it clashes with your values, that's been a really interesting intersection when that's when they knew they had to act. And then how did they do it? How did they actually take the steps to create that company that does it better? And that's why these stories are important. And, and yeah, they're mind-boggling because there is so much. And I'll tell you what, as an author, it was really, really, really hard for me to have hours and hours with a person that is so amazing in their thinking and so accomplished and to be able to, and really to have to synthesize their life into 5,000 words or less per chapter. You know, they are gifting me the stories of their lives and hours of time and I have to take all of that and put it in 5,000 words. So that was really, really hard and I'm doing the second book right now and I'm struggling again, but I think that's, that's why I love it. It's because I'm, I feel so lucky that they're sharing these stories with me, that they're, they're telling me, you know, a lot of this stuff gets kind of emotional because they're going way back to something somebody told them who's no longer with us. And so there's a lot in, that goes on in the interviews, but it comes out in, 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 a, in a way where I come back, okay, but what I really want to do is I really want to inform people so that other people can do what she did. Other students can grow up and start companies like he did. And that ultimately is what I focus on when I synthesize all of it. It comes down to I become like an educator. You know, this is what I've learned. This is how they did it. And let me help you think through what you might do if you decide to enter this particular industry. And then I provide a lot of variety, too. So I'm happy to hear that it blew your mind because I think each of these Latino innovators is a, a, a mind-blowing example of a creative human and an entrepreneur. And if we could just have millions more wow, we could just really be smart with everything that we, that we do and create. Well, I want to um, ask you one question that's a little bit, uh, I think, more about our social and cultural significance and stuff that's going on right now. I know that you, you talk in the book about wanting to change the conversation and just really, like we've talked about this, this half hour, showcasing these people. And like you said, some came from a disadvantaged background, some not so much, but you wanted to, to change the level of conversation. And right now, um, especially in the United States, we have the, the Black Lives Matter movement, which is really, again, about building awareness and, and getting um, changing some attitudes and changing the conversation as well. So um, coming from the background of having, a, you know, a Latino background, how do you feel, you know, because then people came and they said, well, all lives matter, and then there's the blue lives matter. And, and as a Latino, how do you look at this idea of, as the black lives matter? And do you feel that maybe having a Latino lives matter is, is necessary? Or do you feel that this conversation raises all of those conversations about the way we maybe view immigrants or um, people who are overrepresented in our, in our justice system um, or come, uh, come as immigrants? I was just wondering your thoughts on that. All of those hashtag movements, well, especially Black Lives Matter, okay, you know, let's talk about that because everything else is a response to that. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, our lives matter also. But let, let's talk about the origins here. What, what's happening is a movement of saying, okay, enough already with the white, white supremacy in every aspect of American society. This is what's going on. It's people standing up and saying, you know, enough. And it's being expressed in many different ways. Okay. This, this, I think fundamentally it comes to that. It's for, for too long, communities have been ignored who don't look like the publishers of the textbooks. I'm going to mention something about that. Uh, the, the textbooks in Texas, um, I'll, I'll mention just real briefly because this is real and this is easily uh, found. There is a textbook right now that's already been published in Texas that the Texas uh, Board of Education has proved that very specifically... Uh, describes the white workers, you know, this is a history book, the white workers as being devoted and dedicated workers and et cetera, et cetera. And the, Mex the workers of Mexican descent were lazy and had to be continuously oh motivated. Goodness. This isn't a history textbook, okay? And the Texas State Board of Education has already approved this because, you know, they actually chose the publisher for it. This is very intentional. So 
They want kids today in 2016 who are going to start using the textbook this fall unless the legal challenges, you know, succeed. They want kids today and in the future to be raised believing this negative, nasty stereotype that's false instead of knowing that, in fact, it is Mexicans and Mexican-Americans who built our cities, right? Mm -hmm. And so to answer your question, you know, history, history has forever excluded people who don't look like the publishers, it just has. It's been unkind. It's been inaccurate. Completely ignored us. And so this is why I created a publishing company. Because when you have the publishing company, you can create the content. And you can create the excellent literature. You can put it out in the world. You can put it up for awards. And you can tell the stories that you want to tell. Publishers are extremely powerful. And once I got to know where the power was, I said, okay, then that's what I need to do. And so my little company family-owned firm here in California, we have the same distribution networks and wholesale networks as the big publishers in New York in terms of how schools and libraries buy and everything because that's really, it's like I'm sick and tired of someone else telling the stories of our community and being wrong, nasty, stereotyping, and malicious, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so Black Lives Matter, obviously, you know, it's a reaction to specific crimes and violent deaths at the hands of the police. That's where this all started. But overall, and, and you know, all the other hashtag variables of it, it, it comes from that place where that's why they started it. It's like, I'm sick and tired of my community being misrepresented. So I think, you know, in terms of the social conversation, you know, there, there's a few things that, that, that I think are really, really important that, you know, what, what should happen when you read the Latino baiting stories? This is really how I think that like, what do I want to happen? And the books are used in middle schools and high schools and community colleges. So all readers first learn about emerging and growing industries. Okay, they learn how the featured entrepreneur made his way into the industry, you know, and doing it as if the planet matters. And, and again, how to, like we talked about. So that's, that's number one. But number two, it's really, I want to inspire just more and more students across the nation from all backgrounds, all communities, to attend and complete university studies. I, I'm seeing us drop further and further behind in terms of graduation rates you know, compared to other nations in terms of having educated citizens. And that bothers me very, very much. And my own story of being first to attend college as a daughter of immigrants really informs and powers that, that motivation. But lastly, it's, it's what we were just talking about. You know, the need for positive images and success stories from our American Latino community, you know, to reach the minds of all Americans has never been greater. Just, it's never been greater. And, you know, decades of negative images about Latinos uh, from Hollywood continues. And now the negativity, of course, has leaked big time into the news cycles thanks to a very bigoted presidential candidate. Yuck. Yeah. So, you know, what can we each do? You know, we change the conversation by putting out different stories putting out stories that counter the negative stereotype. You know, you, you've been raised to think that Mexican people and Mexican-American people are lazy. Well, here's some stories of some successful business owners and innovators and entrepreneurs. And, you know, then they get interviewed on TV and radio, and then we start to see some stories here and there. Okay, these are drops in a bucket compared to the power of mass media to put out what they put out. But I can only do what I do, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I know that it works, you know, with the positive stories because of, of one little story. I was keynoting. I had just delivered a keynote in Boulder, Colorado at the Green Schools National Conference. It was like 3,500 teachers there. And a woman approached me at the table and bought 15 books. Mm -hmm. And so I asked her, oh, are these for your students? And she smiled at me and she said, actually, these are for my school board. I'm on the school board of a local school district <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> because they need their expectations reformed. I actually use that. Instead of education reform, I say expectation reform. Like expect your Latino students to grow up like this. Expect them to grow up like me. Expect them to grow up like Luis Rojas and Sandra Artelejo and Frank Ramirez and the people I talked about today. Expect that. Expect, you know, higher expectations and ex you know, reform your own expectations and you will create tomorrow's innovators. But if you continue to believe the negativity and the stereotypes and you keep using words like socioeconomic disadvantage, and if we keep labeling disadvantage, then we're saying we expect less. And I say, no, 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 no. We need to reform our expectations. And so this woman, bless her heart, 
heard that message of expectation reform and bought books for her school board because she knows what I know and that it starts there. It's the school boards, it's the administrators, everybody else who has been exposed and their parents were exposed to all these negative images about you know, so-called minorities. Well, guess what? The minorities are now the majority in K-12 classrooms. As of the fall of 2014, the student population nationally in this country is majority minority. It already is. And so all of this anxiety, you know, the media calls it white anxiety. There's different words for that. But it's, it's so silly to me because those are all, you know, labels that somebody came up with that are racial labels and ethnic labels. And, and, and they've all just been used to divide and, you know, make some groups submissive to other groups. And I think what we're seeing now is as we transition to a majority-minority nation, you're just not going to be able to keep the groups that have been demeaned and ignored quiet anymore. And social media is really enabling that. And I think that's where we saw Black Lives Matter. It's, it's, let's elevate that. And then, of course, what do we see? Oh, well, all lives matter. In other words, you know, go sit down and let's talk about everybody else, not your cause. And so all of that's going on. I think it's fascinating. Um, it's also a crazy time to be a parent because my kids, you know, my kids are biracial from day one, half Latino, half Japanese. So they're Asian Latinos, I think would be the correct word. <laughs> I don't know. They're Californians. And their kid, their, their friends at school all look like them. They're mixed. You know, we have Mexicans. We have, we have the Korean, Vietnamese, Irish combinations. I mean, we've got everybody, right? And it's beautiful. But when you're a child like that and you turn your television on and you hear some of the stuff you hear on TV, it, you know, then I have to explain it. I have to explain where that comes from and what's driving it. And um, I, I do what I do. I want our community that has always been contributing significant, you know, labor capital, intellectual capital, and companies. And we, we have more business creation coming from the Latino community, two and three times the national average per census data, year after year. Every five years, they measure businesses. And the Latino community consistently outperforms all other groups in terms of business creation. And if you just look at Latinas, it's six times the national average. We're highly entrepreneurial. We, we just have to invent. We have to make. And we really want to be in charge of our own destiny. And so I think this is a story that hasn't been told. I mean, have you ever seen on CNN that the Latino community is creating two and three times more businesses than anybody else? No. I've never seen that reported. But it's data easy enough to find in the, in the Census Bureau. But again, that's part of what is not known and what is intentionally kept quiet. Because, wow, what if we actually learned that the Latino community is economically powerful and actually owes a lot of businesses and actually creates a lot of... You know, so then it wouldn't fit the narrative that mainstream media owners want to communicate about our community. And so there's a lot of us from the Latino community writing books, I chose very intentionally, Angela, to write about the environment, sustainability, job creation, entrepreneurship, because these are mainstream themes that everybody cares about. We care about where the jobs come from. We care about our environment. We care about business. So let me write some Latino, uh, Latino Vader stories that fit those themes so that we can be in that conversation versus what you see usually is. Let's bring a Latino on to talk about immigration. <laughs> Yeah, because we can keep everybody else thinking about Latinos as immigrants, even though a lot of Latinos are not immigrants. They've always been here. Right. Yes. But it's that that um, if you if you see Latinos on TV every day talking about business, then you might think something different about Latinos. Right. So that's what I'm doing. It's, um, I guess, social activism through literature, social activism through um, educational literature that actually teaches something and, and that inspires. So. I think we can do all of those things through literature, and that is why I do what I do. Well, I am so grateful that you do what you do. Uh, even just hearing that story about the textbook and tech, that just made my heart Ugh. hurt. I actually had a little bit of a tear guy, which is why I just, it's just it's craziness. But I just I love how um, you your message of empowerment, and it's inspiring, and it's not about tearing things down. It's about, look, it's about building people up, communities up, ideas. And I love that idea of expectation reform. 
Well, I want to thank you so much. I, um, this is the, the point in time where I just give you the opportunity to share with my listeners where they can find your book. You can tell them when your next book is coming out and uh, websites, social media, all of that stuff you'd like to leave them with today. Yeah. Well, Latino Baiting is a series. Uh, volume one is the first one that is in the world. I am 75% finished with the interviews for the second book. And so I'm looking in the next 18 months to two years to get it done. Because you can imagine it's, um, it's a lot for every chapter. So I'm looking in the next 18 months to two years for the second volume. And they'll be entirely different industries. Uh, this one's going to be very heavy with stories of women. The first one is 50-50. So latinovating.com is the book's website. And the root, very important, is not Latino. The root is actually in, innovating. So you write the word innovating, and then you put L-A-T in front of it, and that's latinovating, and that's actually a trademark now. So latinovating.com is where you can see uh, videos and endorsements and reviews and um, invite me to speak at schools and conferences on entrepreneurship and um, everything we discussed today. The book is, of course, available on Amazon, Kindle, Google Play, all ebook formats, iTunes, it's out there um, that way as well. And the second one will be as well. And um, I think those are the important sites. You could also find uh, me on Facebook with my full name uh, or just go straight to uh, uh, facebook.com slash gracefully global group. And you can find me that way. So I'll provide you the links, but uh, certainly just let the innovating.com is the starting point. And when you purchase from there, um, my company fulfills it and books can be personalized and signed to specific students and things like that versus Amazon. It's a, it's a different uh, process. Yes. Well, I want to thank you so much for being on the program today. Just inspiring stories. You're a fantastic speaker and, um, Yes, I just really appreciate the work that you're doing out in the world. Thank you so much. Well, and I appreciate what you are doing to highlight the work that we do because um, it, it's so important to to collaborate and to be able to ripple effect and amplify. So I'm very grateful to you, Angela. Oh, thank you. All right, well, coming up next week, we are talking with Mark, Mark Hawthorne about his book, A Vegan Ethic, and we'll be discussing our industrialized food system and our compassionate movement to eating a more uh, plant-based diet. So if you want to find out more about Conversations from the Brink or the show, Entanglement Radio, you can go to conversationsfromthebrink.com. If you'd like to know more about myself, Angela Levesque, you can go to hestiahealth.com, and you can find us on Facebook and on Twitter. Well, this is Angela Levesque. Um, I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening.